When Jesus commanded his disciples to go to the people of Israel, announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he gives them a warning and some advice. He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The two animals could hardly be more opposite. The predatory serpent, a symbol for Satan, and the gentle dove, representing the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus instructs his disciples to be like both of them. So what did Jesus mean when he told his disciples to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves? Let's proceed. And Jesus using a snake and a dove is the use of similes, figures of speech that compare two unlike things to instruct his disciples in how to behave in their ministry. Just before he tells them to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, he warns them that they were being sent out like sheep among wolves. So when using these similes, Jesus invokes the common view of serpents and doves. The serpent was subtle, crafty, and shrewd. The dove, on the other hand, is thought of as innocent and harmless. To this very day, doves are used as a symbol of peace, and snakes thought of as sneaky, devious, and tricky. This is the quality that Jesus told his disciples to model as he sent them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. The world, then as now, was hostile towards believers. Not incidentally hostile, but purposefully hostile. Wolves are intentional about the harm they inflict upon sheep. Jesus taught his followers to be Christ-like in a godless world. They must combine the wisdom of the serpent with the harmlessness of a dove. In this hostile world towards the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we must also be wise, avoiding the snares set for us, and we must be innocent, serving the Lord blamelessly. And using the snake as a symbol of wisdom, Jesus was not suggesting that we stoop to deception, but that we should model some of the serpent's famous shrewdness in a positive way. Wisdom does not equal dishonesty, and innocence does not equal gullibility. Let us consider Jesus as an example. The Lord was known as a gentle person. Scripture even testifies a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. Matthew here is quoting a prophecy from Isaiah 42 that pointed to the actions and demeanor of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. In the prophecy, the bruised reed and the smoldering wick refer to the spiritually, physically, and morally weak. A reed that is bruised may be damaged, but is not irreparable. The smoking flax may be about to lose its fire altogether, but it can still be reignited. But was Jesus always and only gentle? No. When the occasion demanded it, he took a whip in hand and chased the money changers out of the temple. Jesus' extraordinarily rare action, seen in light of his usual manner, demonstrates the power of using a combination of tools. This dove-like man of innocence spoke loudly and clearly with his assertiveness in the temple and meted out justice and judgment to those who defied his father's house. Remember, Matthew twelve twenty concludes with, till he sends forth justice to victory. You see, Jesus showed that he was as wise as a serpent in the way he taught. He discerned the differences in his audiences. He used a storytelling technique to both feed and weed, and he refused to be caught in the many traps that his enemies laid for him. Jesus showed that he was as harmless as a dove in every circumstance. He lived a pure and holy life. He acted in compassion, and he challenged anyone to find fault in him. Three times, Pilate judged Jesus to be an innocent man. Jesus' simile, wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove, shows us successful Christian living requires that we strike the optimal balance between the dove and the serpent. We should strive to be gentle without being pushovers, and we must be sacrificial without being taken advantage of. We are to be aware of the unscrupulous tactics used by the enemy. But we take the high road. Peter admonishes us 
live such good lives above the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The disciples were given authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Yet they were not to be arrogant or bullies, not to think on themselves as superior or better than any of their fellow man. The importance of being both wise and innocent is that of showing spiritual strength while being harmless, innocent without naivety. What Jesus means when he instructs us to be wise as serpents is for us to act intelligently and wisely in the decisions that we make, always conversing with our guide, the Holy Spirit. It requires us to be prudent in all that we do, but being mindful of each other and how we are to affect each other in the physical as well as the spiritual. Paul explains this more in Romans 16, 19, when he tells us, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Godly wisdom must prevail over devilish subtlety. As Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 39, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now this leads us into the second part of this study. What did Jesus actually mean when he told us, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. The concept of turning the other cheek is a difficult one for us to grasp. Allowing a second slap after being slapped once does not come naturally to any of us. However, we have to understand the word slap or smite it used by Jesus is a representation or a euphemism for being slighted, insulted, offended, dissed, or disparaged. So what Jesus here speaks of are personal slights of any kind. The slap or the smiting does not have to involve literal physical violence. Even in our day, a slap in the face is a metaphor for an unexpected insult or offense. So Jesus is saying, did someone insult you? Let them. Jesus says, are you shocked and offended? Don't be. And don't return insult for insult. Turn the other cheek. Turning the other cheek does not imply pacifism, nor does it mean we place ourselves or others in danger. Jesus' command to turn the other cheek is simply a command to forego retaliation for personal offenses. For example, I remember about seven or eight months ago, I was watching this news report of a woman who unalived both her sisters over an insult on Facebook. They had gone back and forth on Facebook insulting one another. When one day she challenged her sisters to come over and tell it to her to her face. And so they did. They came over to their mother's home where the sister was as well as where her sister's kids were as well. When the women got out of the car, the woman pushed one of the other woman's sons out of the way and began shooting both her sisters unalive, both of them in front of their kids just sad. And all the woman said about the killing of her sister was they were talking all this S-H-I-T and they pulled up on me. This unwillingness to turn the other cheek after being slighted resulted in the death of two women because of retaliation for a personal offense. There was a time in history when a man felt compelled to protect his honor against one who slandered him or otherwise dishonored his name. The offended party would challenge the offender to a duel, swords, firearms, or other weapons, and there would be a duel to the death. It was just senseless bloodshed. This is exactly what Jesus told us to tolerate. Turning the other cheek would have been better option than dueling or to kill someone over a slight. Retaliation is what most people expect and how worldly people act. Turning the other cheek requires responding to hatred with love, personal slights and insults by allowing the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit to give you gentleness and meekness instead of riling accusations, retaliation and vindictiveness. Jesus himself was a perfect example of turning the other cheek because he was silent before his accusers and did not call down revenge from heaven on those who crucified him. Instead, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. However, as Christians, we are not to be doormats for other people. 
a small rug inside a doorway where people can wipe their dirty shoes on. We are not to allow people to just walk on us. Nowhere does God call for us to allow others to abuse us, disparage us, or take advantage of us without mounting a defense. Jesus telling us to be innocent and harmless as a dove and for us to turn the other cheek was not that of teaching his disciples or us to be dormant. Rather, he was teaching that to glorify God and show ourselves to be his true children, we need to be pure inside and out and to be as accommodating as possible for the sake of a lost world. The turn the other cheek does not mean we place ourselves or others in danger or that of ignoring injustice. Allowing yourself to be used as a doormat is neither noble nor Christ-like. We are to be wise as a serpent and meek as a dove, shrewd and soft. When we are the objects of personal slights, slaps on the cheek, our first response is not to retaliate in kind, but to turn the other cheek to avoid furtherance of evil. An example of turning the other cheek to avoid the furtherance of evil can be seen in road rage incidents. About six months ago, I was driving on a very busy street and all three lanes were crowded. So I was driving slow, matching the stop and go traffic. But there was this young lady that wanted to get in before me and I guess she felt I wasn't moving fast enough or I didn't let her in. And she began cursing me, calling me all the most foul names that possibly could be, climbing out her window, yelling and screaming at me. I just turned my head away from her, turned my other cheek and ignored the things that she yelled at me. That is what he refers to, turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate because those people look for evil and violence. But being a doormat is weakness, but choosing forgiveness is strength. As it tells us in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So I hope this study brought understanding and clarity to you. Be blessed, my friends, in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.